Hello, and welcome to Change the Face of Yoga, teaching toddlers through golden oldies. I'm very excited to be talking to lots of yoga teachers who will explain their passion for teaching yoga to students with different ages, physical fitness levels, wellness levels, and different goals. They will explain the benefits of yoga for these students and will be including teacher tips and pose modifications. I am Stephanie Cunningham of Yoga Lightness, and I've been teaching over 50s for 10 years. So this area is my passion and the passion of many other yoga teachers that you will be listening to in this series. Thank you so much for listening, and let's get started. This is episode 19 of Changing the Face of Yoga, and second in the series of on Future of Yoga, and we are talking to Linda Baird, who is an expert in ethics and a yoga teacher. And we will talk about yoga and ethics in the classroom. We're really lucky to have Linda Baird with us today. And Linda is going to discuss uh, the ethical issues in yoga. And some are good and some are bad, but she's extremely uh, knowledgeable in this area. And I want to tell you a little bit about her. She is a licensed psychotherapist and a certified yoga instructor in Colorado in the United States. Uh, Most recently, she's been teaching ethics and consulting on ethical issues within her yoga community, which is para-yoga. She's also been involved with the Hakomi International Ethics Committee and the Right Use of Power Institute for over 10 years. And she says she's passionate about reframing the definition of ethics, helping people to stand in their authentic power while leading with their heart. So welcome, Linda. You sound like this is going to be a really exciting uh, podcast. I'm really looking forward to it. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that introduction? I don't think so. I just will say that I want to honor the people who I've studied with, um, Cedar Barstow, who is my mentor in the right use of power, which is ethics for healing professionals. And I've been working with her for quite a while. She's also a Hakomi trainer. And I want to honor my teacher, Yoga Rupa Rod Stryker, who's the founder of Para Yoga. I feel very, very blessed to be in the Para Yoga community. And, and uh, I recently helped um, Yoga Rupa write our grievance process and also our, our Code of Ethics, which is just a very, really beautiful document. I'm very, very proud to have been part of that process. Oh, that sounds wonderful. I think we do need some documents like that, (laughs) given some of the things that have happened. So let's start at the very basic and ask, and you tell me what your definition of ethics is and how that applies in the yoga world. For our purpose, ethics is a set of values, attitudes, and skills intended to have benevolent effects when applied through professional guidelines, decision-making processes, and the practice of compassion. And I just simply like to say that uh, ethics is standing in your strength while staying in your heart. That's a pretty simple definition. Standing in your strength, that would be in the yoga community, perhaps our knowledge of yoga and what it can do. And how do we make sure that we stay in our heart when we're doing that? Well, I think that we, it's, there's something that's really important about I'm not sure if this is quite addressing the question, but there certainly are the yamas and niyamas and paying attention to the to nonviolence and correct speech and truthfulness, everything we know about the yamas and niyamas. But, but also recognizing that we have influence due to our role as teachers and tracking what's happening with our students and being really sensitive to what's happening to, with our students watching for the nuances and the subtleties of relationship and communication. I never thought of that as being an ethical requirement, but when you talk about it like that, I understand what you mean. Yeah, (laughs) it really is, isn't it? Yeah, there are many components of ethics. You know, I think it's, I was reading through the Yoga Alliance, very simple code of ethics, because that's what is here in the United States. And it doesn't, it just to me doesn't address the richness and the subtleties of ethics. And the things that we really need to pay attention to. And what are the things that we really need to ta- pay attention to? Well, we need to be we need to understand something about that when we're in a, a teacher position that 
it's like an up, it's a step up in power it, due to this authority that we have as teachers that we actually have more power in the relationship. Well, let's let's start from the from the top, from the culture of yoga. And the yoga okay. culture is based on the guru teacher model. And from an ethical standpoint, what is good and what is bad about that particular model potentially? <laughs> the teacher student or the guru student model? Yep. Well, I think that there are I'm looking at how we don't we don't sometimes step into our power whether we're we don't realize that there's a power differential and i think that that is um potentially problematic if we find it difficult to accept that we have um a role that creates a power inequality and it's uh, the the inequality is effective is important to our effectiveness in our role as teacher or mentor or trainer and also uh, that, that sometimes we have to focus on relationship. That yoga often, especially I think yoga in the West, it's become very task oriented, you know, do this pose, do this breathing style, do whatever. So it's more focused on task or move your body in this way. When sometimes what we need to do is focus a little bit on relationship and track what's happening in relationship. Is that relationship between the teacher and the student? Or yes. between the teacher or the bo- the student's body and themselves. I mean, where are we? The what teacher. Is- well, I'm I'm talking about the teacher and the student. That oh. the teacher tracking what's happening in the classroom. That it's not just or the yoga studio. That it's you know it's not just about doing a posture a certain way. But noticing if a student's struggling. If there's uh, you know, if if they're having, there's some kind of an emotional response that's happening. And we can't always attend to that in a classroom, you know, to individuals and give them a lot of time. But there's just something about really attending to what's happening in the nuances of the relationship. So what are the the negative possibilities of not attending to that relationship? Well, that uh, that a student would leave and never come back. I think that's the biggest one, you know, that, that I I can say from my, I can share a personal story about that, if that would be helpful. No, it's great. Okay, well, so there was a time where I uh, actually slipped on the way into a yoga studio on, on some gravel that was out in front of the studio, and I popped my hamstring badly. And so I kind of limped into the studio and I decided to attend to the class anyway. And I just, I felt like the teacher just didn't, didn't acknowledge or attend at all to what was happening with me. And it wasn't that I needed special attention. I didn't want someone to devote, do a yoga therapy session with me, but somehow just to acknowledge or attend, because I know I had said that I had injured myself and I didn't go back to that teacher. And so I think even just that, even just being able to say, is, does anyone have any injuries? Is there anything that you need? Or tracking if someone does injure themselves or you know seems to be having a, tr- a problem with something. I think that's really important. So that's, I think, one of the biggest dangers is that a student won't return. Also that a student could tell other people uh, that they had a bad experience and, you know, that that could, people tend to tell people when they have a bad experience and not a good experience. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes too, there could be some kind of a, you know, a grievance if it was a yoga therapy session or, uh, you know, an individual session, there could be at worst some kind of a, you know, a grievance or something depending, like we have, we have in para yoga, we have an ethics committee and we have a grievance process so that if a student has some sort of a a grievance with a teacher, they can come to us and we can go through a process and try to create some sort of a repair. But I think that's where it spirals down in the worst case scenario. A student feels that they weren't treated correctly and then leaves and tells others about it. So that, that kind of gets us into this, what is the right use of power, which is, which you say you prefer to call skillful use of power of yoga teachers. One of the things is that we must be attentive to the relationship. Are there other aspects of that? We certainly have to work with our own shadow side. 
we have to recognize something about, you know, the issues for ourselves that may come up, perhaps running away from being accountable because we, we're afraid of being accountable or we're afraid of blame. We've, we've agreed that we have a power gradient here. That, yes. That teachers, mm-hmm. as a result of our, well, as a result of just being teachers, we have more power than the student. And that that's a fact. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and what we need now, I think, is how do we talk about that? How do we think about that at, within the yoga culture, within the yoga philosophy to still embody the yoga ideas and, and yet still be ethically good teachers? I really feel it's about relationship that and it's about tracking what's happening in relationship and tracking whether we have an intention, but the impact is different, like like a student may respond differently than we had intended, that we're just watching what's what's happening and we're asking questions. And of course, I think another issue is, uh, and you had mentioned this to me, but the use of touch and how we do adjustments. I think that's really important to talk about too. I'll start with my own (laughs) bias on adjustments. (laughs) I got thrown into a wall during teacher training Mm. as an adjustment. And at the same time, someone was talking about how she had popped her hamstring because someone decided she could go lower in monkey pose. And so I'm a little leery of adjustments, especially since I work with seniors who have more fragile bodies. And I'm not sure that, I mean, everybody's body's different, especially seniors, because they've lived their body for, you know, 50, 60 years. And so their bodies are going to be very different. And I'm not sure that I really agree with assessments, adjustments, sorry, adjustments. I do agree with assessments (laughs) because I think it starts with the premise that Everybody has to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree very much with you. And I've had some very similar experiences with, uh, at one point in my uh, early yoga career, path with yoga, I had a senior teacher come and kick a block out from under my hand when I was ah. doing trikonasana. <laughs> and I popped and I popped my hamstring. That was my very first hamstring injury. And I remember people, there was certain teachers of a certain style of yoga that handstand was a great big deal to do. And being told, if you can't do, if you can't do handstand, there's something wrong with you, kind of, you know, why, why can't you do this? You've been practicing for so long. So uh, I just think that's just being attuned with people's bodies and, and really saying, you know, that this isn't about some task. Again, there's that aspect of task. This isn't about being able to accomplish a task. It's about being in your body and understanding what is right for your body. And also, of course, there's the issue of trauma and how it's held in the body. I I am a a trauma therapist. That's what I, I work a lot with in my psychotherapy practice. And we have to be really skillful about how we come to people with adjustments. And do people want to be touched? And tracking. Is it appropriate? You know, asking for permission. I know there are a lot of teachers that I have experienced who don't ask for permission. They just come in. And the idea has been expressed that if you just come in with authority that you can do the adjustment. And I don't agree with that. No, I don't either. My concern is, is there really a need for adjustment? Obviously, if someone, you know, is doing something that could harm them, I could see where you might want to adjust or at least tell them Mm -hmm. (laughs) or give them something better to do. (laughs) But is there really a need for adjustment? Do we all have to look alike in a class? No. (laughs) (laughs) I think you and I would be in the same boat with that, (laughs) that, that, there's two two aspects. Certainly, we can give verbal cues, good verbal cues for alignment, for for proper alignment. Is that kind of an ethical consideration that we start with this idea that we're all supposed to do these perfect asanas and we're all supposed to look the same way? Is is that an ethical consideration, or is it just me being difficult? <laughs> no, it's not. I think it isn't. I think it is an ethical consideration because 
it's not, you're focusing on task and not on relationship. And you said something earlier that I think was important that you asked, is it, is it the student teacher relationship or is it the student's relationship with their own body? And it's both because really what we're trying to do with yoga is help people develop a relationship with their, with their bodies and with their, with their energy, with their prana. And so how every student is going to do that, it's going to look different. Like you said, seniors, it's going to look very different for seniors or you, like you don't know where someone's body has been in, you know, however many years they've been on the planet. And so to me, our job is just to encourage proper alignment and to ask questions about, you know, what's happening in your body or, do, do, you know, does something hurt or, and, and just to give those, those cues instead of saying it has to be done this way. Let me share another little, um, I was, um, in my very first uh, 200 hour yoga teacher training, there was a, a senior teacher of a, it was a senior Iyengar teacher. And, but this person said, you cannot hurt yourself in yoga. That was a statement that was said. And I raised so many concerns because that was after I had popped that hamstring. And I just really, I had such a fundamental disagreement with that, that, you know, if we're not attentive and we're not sensitive that people can definitely get hurt in yoga. And it's very important that we be mindful of how we're encouraging people to move their bodies. And my first teacher was I younger, so I, I understand. Um, <laughs> one thing that I would like to talk about, sure. probably because, because of who I teach, is frail and vulnerable mm -hmm. populations. And that's, oh. That's a lot. I mean, that's people with mental health issues. That's people that are older, people that are younger, people that are pregnant, people. In fact, almost everybody is <laughs> could at some point in their lives be a frail and vulnerable population. And do we not have some kind of ethical responsibility, more of an ethical responsibility to those kinds of populations or or not? Oh, I think we definitely do. That's that's, again, some of the the power differential, which is the person who is in the, the student role is the one it has is more vulnerable. The person in the teacher role therefore has more responsibility with those populations. Absolutely. Other than kind of a glance at yamas and niyamas, I don't think that we actually covered anything like that in my teacher training. I'm trying to, th I know I didn't do it in the beginning, the basic one. I'm trying to think if we did yeah, not, not, no, I don't think we did in the other one. I may be wrong on that. But how, how should that be integrated into teacher training? Because I think, at least when I was taught, it was very much how to do the asanas, how to put a sequence together. And yes, those are the really basic things of being a teacher. But it seems like we also need to talk to the emotional part of it as well. Or, oh, I think that's very important. This is, I'm so grateful that I've been able to, to my, my teacher, Rod Stryker, has invited me in to start to do some teaching in our community around ethics. I don't think, and I'm just trying to remember in my teacher trainings, if we ever, I don't believe that we, aside, like you said, from the yamas and niyamas, I don't think I ever had any, any training in ethics. So I think it's, I think it's very important to attend to this. And this is where I go into the, uh, the right use of power. I've been, this is, I've kind of tailored this work for teaching to the yoga community and I'm still working on it. It's kind of a new, a new project, but I think it's really important. I was impressed with this question that you gave me, which is, it's almost the opposite of what we've been talking about, which is not paying attention and not and overusing your power, but how do we may underuse our power? Mm -hmm. And what are the ethical consequences of that? So I think that in the yoga world, we like to think about equality and we, we like to think of it kind of as we're all one. I think there's a tendency to not step into our power and not recognize that there's an inequality. And really, 
part of our effectiveness as a teacher is about our role and our authority. When we're only task-oriented, we're not focusing on the relationship. Um, That's a downside. We may run into some of the obstacles of using our power skillfully when we don't recognize that we have power. We're not using our power skillfully. And and what would that that mean exactly? Uh, Is that the relationship? I mean, just making sure that we're very attentive to how our students are doing in class, physically, mentally, um, or is there a little bit more to it? Well, I think there, I think there is more. There, there is really stepping into it. If we notice that someone is having a hard time, if we notice that that we say something and a student has some doesn't respond in the way that we might have thought they would if a student doesn't come back to class for a while. But sometimes it's that, that, I, that I think there's a little bit of stepping into relationship and, and asking questions purely in curiosity. It's not, not making assumptions about anything, but just being curious. And, you, you know, curiosity goes a long way. Like being able to say, you know, after a class, I'm curious how that was for you. You know, I noticed that, that, po- that if it was a pose, it might have been really hard for you or... Gee, I haven't seen you in a while. I'm just, you know, wondering how you're doing. It's like that kind of genuine concern about relationship. That makes sense. It does. I'm just, I'm just thinking it through, and and I can, I can say that because I have small classes, I can do that, and and often do. But I'm wondering about someone, and I've seen these absolutely immense yoga classes. Yes. Um, I just wonder how you can do that if you have 50 people in your class. Well, I think with that, that you can offer, you can just offer cues then for students to check in with themselves. You know, you might offer periodically some sort of a cue about to, to just pause and notice. When I do sessions, I do individual sessions. I will start a session. And this is a way that you can start a class too. Just a moment of mindfulness. I I sometimes, you know, I teach small classes, but I will just start a class by having them lay down on their back or perhaps they're in child pose and just to notice where they are when they start. So check in with your mind, with your mental body and notice what's happening you know, check in emotionally, and then maybe do a little bit of a body scan, checking in physically and energetically, just to, to set the, the foundation for where they are. And then throughout the practice, I may throw out some cues, and I might say, just pause for a moment. You know, either might have them go into child's pose or stand in Tadasana and just say, just take a moment to notice what's happening for you right now on all those levels, your mind, your body, your emotional body, energetic body, just check in with yourself and just see what's happening. Just notice. And then at the end of the practice, I might do that same, same thing I started with and just say, okay, so just now, like starting into Shavasana, um, I might just say, okay, let's just do a scan and have you check in with yourself. And so that they're checking in with themselves. And then I might just the general cue, you know, if there's something, if there are any, if there there's anything that you have any question about if if something didn't work for you to please let me know i would probably say that after shavasana you know at the end of the class but that that might be a way to engage a larger class and create a little bit of of opening for not only the students to check in with themselves about what's happening through the practice but to to say if there's any concerns that you have please please come and tell me those are great tips. That's that's really great because I was really wondering how someone would be able to do that with that many students. But those are those are really wonderful. I think I might do those even in my s- small classes because sure. um, I probably don't use it enough. I probably don't do that enough. And um, I think that that's a great way to get a handle on what's going on. You would ask me a question earlier about heart, and I just think that our when as we are connected with ourselves and our own heart that that we can convey that and we can convey warmth even to a big class. I mean, I know I've been to all kinds of classes with all kinds of teachers. And when someone is really coming from the warmth in their heart, I can feel it. And it it creates an opening where I might want to go talk to that teacher at some point or, you know, sign up for their email or something. Whereas I can feel it also when there's 
kind of a, a distance or there's a kind of when there's when there's a distance that doesn't feel real connected. I think that most yoga teachers do go into the profession hoping for that to be able to express that heart, but I think sometimes it's not easy given the situation. Like I taught in gyms for a while and those are very difficult, I think, because, and I'm sure some people are doing very well at it. I just, it just was me that it was constantly a new group of people and you never really got anywhere. You know, I taught the same class over and over, a beginning yoga class. And it got very frustrating because I didn't feel I could get a relationship with my students because I never knew who was going to show up. I, I guess it's just hard to have a relationship if it's just a one-time thing, at least for me. Yeah. And also I just think, and I don't know about where you are, but I know where I am that, that I think that gyms don't necessarily encourage or welcome maybe some of the more spiritual aspects of yoga. I don't know, like, like chanting or, you know, th that's been my experience. And, uh, you know, that I, I guess that the, every gym is different as far as what they would welcome. But I, maybe I think people in gyms might be coming a little bit more for the workout, you know, for the, and I think a lot of people come to yoga for that too. They come because they want the workout or they want, you know, they want to feel better in their bodies. And, and of course that's a worthy beginnings of yoga, but um, they may not be as open or welcoming of some of the deeper practices of yoga. In my experience, people who come for the physical you know, the asanas and learning all these poses. Often, like I say, yoga gets into you and, you, and yes. it changes you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and, and so I think, you know, if they stay with it long enough, often they come around. I think people can move into the more spiritual if, and I think it's the effect of yoga. Maybe I do think that it's it's really possible for, for someone who just looked at the athletic aspects of it to, to move into more than that. And I bet part of that is part of that is you and and how people relate to you too, and your your encouragement. Uh, this has been really interesting, really fascinating, and you've given some really really great tips to people to act in an ethical manner. And probably we do a lot of those things, but we don't think of them. At least I don't think of them as an ethical action. I, I just think of it as being a teacher. And so, but to point those out that we are acting ethically um, when we do these kinds of things, or we can do them even with very large classes, I think is a brilliant service um, to yoga teachers. And I want to thank you for that. Is there anything that you would like to add before we leave? <laughs> I think, you know, one of the things that I don't think we talked about, but this is... Um, I also do conflict resolution. That's part of what I do. And I, I teach this. I've been teaching this in my yoga community. And it's, that's really like teaching people how to resolve conflicts when conflicts arise. And along the vein of kind of underuse of power is about barriers to being able to step into our accountability when we, when we make a mistake and inevitably we we make mistakes, we're human. It's what happens. But I just think it's important to, because that is an underuse of power. I think we often equate accountability with, with blame and shame. When for me, accountability, when I can be accountable and really step into it and say, oh, I made a mistake and, and work to repair the, whatever it was that happened, it's incredibly powerful. So I think I would just want to say that, uh, to, you know, I think it's important for people to explore some of the barriers that, that, that are there to accountability. And we all have them. Like the, sometimes I think people are afraid of being accountable. They're afraid about what ma might happen. They're afraid they might get punished if they make a mistake or they admit they make a mistake. You know, shame, feeling, feeling ashamed or feeling paranoid or I think an immediate response that we often have is when someone is upset with us about something is we get defensive instead of being able to just pause and really hear what someone might say if they're upset with us about something, if a student comes to us and is upset about something, that it's just important to be receptive and open and, and be mindful of how we might get defensive. Also, sometimes there's difficulty in even being able to respond, you know, that it's sometimes it might even be hard to say something. 
So I just think those are, that's real important, that whole aspect, that with the role, the kind of role of being in a more authoritative position, that that we have that added responsibility and accountability for what we say and do. Excellent. That's, that's, that's it in a nutshell, isn't it? That we're responsible and accountable for our actions as a teacher. Great. I really appreciate that. That, that does it very well. If uh, I'm just going to let everybody know how they can contact you if they'd like to. Linda Baird's email is firewoman619 at gmail.com. And her website is www.bodymindintegrativetherapy.com. And you've been a wonderful guest, Linda. I really love how you've framed this. Um, I was expecting we'd be talking about Bikram and all that kind of stuff. No. <laughs> but instead, we've We all we've know about really, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unfortunately, we do, don't we? Um, but we've really talked about how the teacher in the class room can act ethically and possibly already is, but didn't really understand that that was ethical, uh, uh, that that had an ethical component. And I think that's really, really important that we identify and support uh, those kinds of efforts because we do have power and we should accept it and be accountable for it. So Linda, you've just, you've been great. I'm so, so glad I got you to come on the podcast. <laughs> well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure to be here and I'm, I'm really honored and I welcome contact. I welcome anyone to ask me questions. I love this work so much. It's such important work and I, I just really love it. So thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful interview. If you would like to be a guest on Changing the Face of Yoga, please go to my website, www.yogalightness.com.au, and under the Changing the Face of Yoga tab, you can complete the Be Our Guest form. After reviewing the form and finding it applicable to this podcast, we will send you a link to schedule an interview. Please download, review, and tell your friends of any podcasts that are of interest to you and to them. If you would like to contact me, send an email to info at yogalightness.com.au. And thank you for listening to Changing the Face of Yoga.